This is Elaine Roddy with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs in Ridgetown. And this is part four of the QCurbit Integrated Pest Management Training Workshop. And congratulations, you've made it through all the diseases. There's a lot of diseases to go through. The good news is you will not see most of them, I hope. Um, most of it is an awareness thing. You need to be able to target which diseases you are seeing. So we need to make you aware of all of them. As far as insects go, much, much shorter list. So we'll be starting with the cucumber beetle, moving on to squash bugs, aphids, and two spotted spider mites. There are two different types of cucumber beetle that we see in Ontario. I'd say the striped one is more common and we see it earlier in the season, starting earlier in the season, whereas the spotted cucumber beetle also known as the southern corn rootworm. I think it more commonly overwinters south of the border and then moves up with the wind patterns and we tend to see it later in the season. Not to say that it can't overwinter here because it can, I just don't see it as much as I see the striped cucumber beetle. So they overwinter as an adult. They emerge in late April to early May. They'll feed on a variety of different food sources they do have quite staggered development, so you don't see it in one big flush like you do with some other insects. And then those over, overwintering adults will find newly emerging cucurbit fields on which to feed and lay eggs. And typically, if you plant it, they will find it, even if there's not a huge history of cucurbit production in the immediate area, you always seem to have cucumber beetles. And the biggest issue with the cucumber beetles is the risk of bacterial wilt transmission, which we talked about in the wilt module. Feeding on the cotyledons can be a problem if the feeding is really vigorous, um, but what we're mainly concerned about is the spread of that disease into the plant and causing the wilt. The biggest risk is those early vegetated st vegetative stages of development when that first generation of cucumber beetle adults is actively feeding in the crop. I find that once flowers are present, flowers are their preferred food source, and so they will congregate in those flowers, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because when the flower dies, it drops off and you're not seeing the movement of the bacteria from the flower into the plant. So high numbers can still be a concern, not to say that bacterial wilt transmission can't happen at that time. It just seems to be less of a risk. Many of our seed treatments will protect the crop through those early stages of development. So the first six weeks after planting, you'll get good control with the insecticidal seed treatments. And then the second period of activity that we need to concern ourselves with is during fruit sizing and development. If you get large numbers of first generation adults emerging from the soil, because that those overwintering adults, as they feed, they lay their eggs in the soil. The larvae will live in the soil feeding off of roots. They usually don't cause a yield issue from a root damage standpoint because the plants are actively growing and very vigorous. But when that next generation of adults emerges, if they congregate and feed on the rind, they can become a primary pest of that rind, damaging the quality of it. So it is something to take note of while you're scouting and be prepared to act on if you need to. When we're scouting for cucumber beetles, we want to inspect a minimum of 100 plants at 10 different locations. And you want to be sure to include field edges and fence rows because that's often where they're moving into the field from. You want to record the total number of adult beetles that you find and then divide that by the number of plants inspected so you know how many beetles per plant you're seeing. The beetles are most active in the morning. I don't know where they go, but they all but disappear in the afternoons. They're hiding in the soil, underneath clods, underneath leaves. It's much harder to find them in the afternoons. So if you're going to be scouting for cucumber beetles, try your best to get to those sites early in the morning. And our threshold is half to one beetle per plant. And that threshold is based on the risk of, of bacterial wilt transmission, not on the actual damage to the plant. So where you've got plants that are highly susceptible to bacterial wilt, you want to use the lower end of that threshold. So the 
crazy thing is that the attractiveness to beetles tends to be the opposite of the susceptibility to welt infection. So there's a huge range in how attractive the plants are to the beetles. The beetles will actively choose different varieties over other ones. So zucchini is one of the most attractive, pumpkins, then melons, cucumbers is their lower preferred food source. They're gonna go to it if there's nothing else, but if you give them a choice, they're gonna choose zucchini. So that can be useful if you're trying to do something like trap cropping, because then you can plant a highly attractive variety along with your commercial crop. And then you just have to control the beetles in that highly attractive variety. You do need to control them because after they run out of food source there, they're just gonna spread out into the commercial crop. The susceptibility to wilt infection is almost the complete opposite. So cucumbers are very susceptible to bacterial wilt, then melons, then pumpkins, then zucchini. So they kind of cross out the impact on each other because you're still gonna to have to have a fairly low tolerance of beetles and cucumbers, even though you might not see as many beetles in that crop. The squash bug is, um, is something I see every year, mainly in pumpkins. I think I don't see it as much in the, in the other crops, not to say that it's never there. They lay these very distinctive, almost bullet-shaped eggs that are laid individually on the lower side of the leaf, often in between the mid vein and the lateral veins. And they're brown in color, quite shiny, laid in groups, very easy to find. And they will hatch out. And what you see, which is a little bit different, you will see all different life stages of the nymphs and the adults and the eggs you'll see all of them active in the crop at the same time. They tend to be most active in um, fields that are very weedy. If there's been a scape of weed control, that sheltered environment is really conducive to, to them. And you'll often see the eggs first, but the larvae are there, they move very quickly. And when there are fruit present, they do tend to really congregate on the fruit. And sometimes they can damage the handles if there's high populations of them but the threshold is fairly high. You can tolerate fairly high populations without it being a yield concern. So one egg mass per plant. So if you're looking at a hundred plants, if you're getting a hundred egg masses, then you're over threshold. So this is the adult, and this shows the range in the nymphs. They change slightly every time they molt. They start out as these very, very tiny black and green nymphs, and then they develop a pearly gray color Every time they molt, they change slightly until they become the adult here with the hard shelled wing pads and these lined markations on the side of their abdomen. They can be easily confused with marmorated stink bug. Over the past number of years, there's been a lot of concern about the impacts of brown marmorated stink bug on horticultural crops in Ontario. Luckily, it has been mainly an urban pest. We haven't seen it a lot in the agricultural landscape, and hopefully it stays that way. But you don't want to be sounding the alarm on having found populations of brown marmorated stink bug if what you're dealing with is actually a squash bug. So the edge of the pronotum is quite different. It's smooth and more angular, whereas this one is more sloping, um, more triangular in shape when you look at that thorax. The back of the thorax is more triangular. This one is more shield shaped. The brown marmorated stink bug has white bands on the antennae and it has distinctive triangular markings, whereas on the squash bug, they were more band-like. They do have those markings, but they're more bands than triangles. If you think you've got brown marmorated stink bug, please contact either myself or one of the OMAFRA uh, entomologists so that we can confirm that that's what it is, so that we're not sounding off alarm bells over the wrong pest. Aphids are sporadic, um, but if they move in in high populations, they can do quite a bit of damage. Um, so it's something that you have time to monitor and observe what the population is doing. But if the population is climbing over a number of weeks, you definitely want to control it before you get to that level because you can see here the plants have just been completely overrun with aphids. The leaves aren't even open, able to open and fully expand 
because there's so many aphids sucking out the juicy contents of those leaves, they're not able to grow. And on the plastic here, those dots are all molted aphid skins. So as the aphid grows, it sheds its old skin. And that just gives you an idea of the population that's present in this field. I've only seen a field this bad once in my career, makes for interesting photographs. You don't see it a lot. But if you are seeing aphids, definitely take note of the population and whether it's increasing, staying level, or even declining. And the one thing you don't want to do with aphids is if you spray too often or you choose broad spectrum products, you can eliminate the beneficial insects that help keep the aphids under control. So you want to be cautious in your choice of sprays and spray timing. So aphids are more of a problem in hot, dry weather. We don't have a specific threshold. We're just looking for increasing populations. They are very easy to identify. They're slow moving. They are quite small, but you can easily see them with your naked eye or with a hand lens. And they have these cornicles or tailpipes and then a teardrop shaped body. And they're really, they're really sentient. They just find a good place to feed and they stay there. And you'll often see a larger mother aphid with a bunch of little babies. Like aphids can give live birth and that's why the populations can get so high. They can give birth to eggs, but they can also clone themselves. Um, vivipari is the name of the term and they can give live birth. And then each of these individual babies in no time at all, they can turn around and start giving live birth. So populations can increase quickly. It's something to be watching for. We do have the concern of virus transmission, which we talked about in the foliar disease module. The aphid colonies growing in crops are unlikely to be spreading the aphids. And then we also have parasitoids. So a parasitoid is an insect that completes part of its life cycle in another insect. So it's not a true parasite. A parasite lives its entire life on another host body whereas a parasitoid just completes part of its life. So in this case, the larval stage, the adult will lay its egg inside the aphid. Its ovipositor will actually deposit its egg right inside the aphid. The larvae will feed and develop inside the aphid, causing this mummified, really a balloon of a body. And then after it pupates, the, the wasp, the aphidious wasp in this case, will emerge from the aphid mummy and go on to lay more eggs and parasitize more aphids. So they do a great job. Um, they're less active in really hot conditions. So where we tend to see aphids is, and there's also fungal pathogens that impact aphids. So if it's cool and wet, the parasitoids and the fungal pathogens will do a good job controlling that aphid population. And then we also have lady beetles. So this is the adult stage. And then we have the larvae. And the nickname for this species is aphid lion because they will eat just huge numbers of aphids, both the larvae and the adults. So if you're seeing larvae and adults in the field, that's a good thing. And as long as the aphid populations aren't increasing, then you wanna let them do their job. And we've got other natural enemies too. We've got lace wings, which are very quite beautiful. You'll see the egg laid on a single stalk sticking up out of the plant. You'll often see that. And that's the lace wing larvae there. And then this kind of gruesome looking maggoty, type creature is a Cidomyae larvae. That's a fly larvae. And again, voracious feeders. They will just suck the contents right out of the aphid and, and move on to the next one. So all of these things can keep aphid populations in check. So the last pest that I'm going to talk about is spider mites. Most common to see these in watermelons. Last year, we saw some in cucumbers. Um, really, they can feed on any crop. They tend to be present in wheat fields. And as the wheat fields dry down, they will move into whatever else is nearby. So if you're scouting a cucurbit crop and the weed is starting to dry down, something worth keeping an eye out for. It is hard to see these guys with the naked eye. 
if the plants are looking off, then it's worth getting out the hand lens and taking a really good detailed look for them. Quite often the first thing you see are the eggs because they're very spherical and shiny and they catch the light. Or sometimes the first thing you see are the red eyes um, just because they are contrasted against the leaf whereas the rest of the body tends to blend in very well. And these are piercing sucking feeders. So they will just suck the contents out of each cell and then move on to the next one. And the plants start to just look off colored or sometimes there's a bit of a stippling impact to them. They just look off and you need, you need something more than just your eyes to see them. That shows you in a bean plant here, the bronzing impact you can have where they've sucked out each content of the cells. Webbing, because um, they're spider mites, they do produce a bit of webbing. So sometimes that's what you'll see on the lower leaf surface. And like the aphids, you wanna watch for increasing populations. A good rainstorm can wash them away and take care of the problem. But if populations are increasing or if the plants across the field are looking off colored, then that's something that you're gonna to wanna to get in and control before they start to reduce yield. 20 to 30% of crowns with one or two mites per leaf. So a substantial threshold, but not minuscule. So that is the insect stuff. It goes really quickly after going into such detail for many of the diseases. Thank you for following along with these modules. If you need to contact me, if you're seeing something and you're not sure what it is, or you just wanna make me aware of things that you're seeing in the field, I'd love to hear from you. My email is here as is my phone number and um, you can text or call. Either way is great. Thank you very much.